Hi! Today's presentation is about triangulation. Triangulation is a very important aspect and it's the way to validate qualitative research. And it's the last presentation, or let's say the crown presentation, of the series on qualitative research methods. I hope you watched previous videos. And allow me to remind you that I previously uh, presented to you different qualitative research methods, including systematic reviews, content analysis, observations, in-depth interviews, focus group discussion, usability testing, case studies. And as a consequence, we have to close those series of qualitative research methods with triangulation. So we are still in the final presentation of the qualitative research methods. Now, who is the audience of today's presentation? It's mainly researchers who are conducting a thesis. If you are a postgraduate, you are conducting a dissertation, you are a scientist who is uh, trying to publish a conference paper or a journal paper. So in this context, I'm going to present the triangulation topic today. The content of today's presentation, I will give a short introduction, talk about the biases that we face as qualitative researchers, what is triangulation, what are the types of uh, triangulation, the famous negative case sampling, and for sure how to recognize patterns and have a fair representation of your subjects. And finally, some takeaway message. So let's start with the introduction. Now, the objective of triangulation is simple. Triangulation is a method used to increase the credibility and validity of research findings in qualitative research. So the goal here is to enhance the credibility and the trustworthiness of your study. And we often, when we are doing conducting research using qualitative research method, we ask ourselves how to validate my research, how to make my outcomes trustworthy, especially that qualitative research findings are always biased. Now, what are the types of biases that we count, encounter when we do qualitative research and how can triangulation respond to that and try to reduce these biases? Well, first of all, let me define a bias. A bias is a favoring or having a prejudice based on limited information. So all humans, you and me, we are exercising these susceptible biases. So you must be aware that they happen when you are conducting qualitative research. And therefore, in qualitative research, it's, cu it's crucial to identify those biases and aware, be aware about them so that you can guard against them. Also, it's very important because identifying your own biases is challenging. It's not an easy task because we don't realize them. But if you know about them, you can minimize their effects. So allow me to take you now through four of the most famous biases that we are exercising as researchers when we do, or scholars when we do qualitative research. The first bias is the implicit bias. And here it's the collection of attitudes and stereotypes we associate to people without our um, conscious knowledge. So imagine you are interviewing somebody or you are interview or observing a group of people. Uh, by default, what happens is that unconsciously we start to cat classify people, categorize them, and we stereotype and put them in categories. So this is the implicit bias, and you need to be very aware about it to avoid it, to make sure that you really understand the people without stereotyping them. Another famous, or the second famous bias, is the serial position effect. Here, when given a list of items, people are more likely to remember the first few and the last few, while the items in the middle tend to blur. Why this bias is very important? Because when you are asking people to conduct a series of tasks, or are you are asking them to answer a series of questions, or if you are asking them to remember some certain concepts or memories or uh, experiences, if you are not aware that they will forget the middle uh, topics that you discussed with them, you need to be always aware about these biases and you need to interrupt your interviews or your questioning techniques to make sure that you will have a consistent response. And as you can see in this um, uh, uh, graph, here for example, this is how many people can recall words when they are exposed to certain words. At the beginning, they can remember the first uh, words that are used in the beginning of an interview, for example, they forget most in the middle and then they can remember the last. So the serial position effect is very important and therefore, depending on where you will put your question or your uh, uh, qu uh, remarks uh, or observation in the beginning or in the middle or at the end of your uh, survey or of your observation, this can influence your result. The third important bias is called the friendly bias. Here, the tendency of people to agree with those they like in order to maintain a non-confrontational 
conversation and here you lose the honest feedback so if you are asking somebody about a feedback in a questionnaire for example you have an interview for example uh, the people if they are having this friendly bias they will try actually to avoid avoid confrontation and they will try to read your mind in order to give you the answer that is that are pleasing you and this is very dangerous and you need to be aware about it and therefore when you are designing your questionnaire or if you are designing your uh, observation technique you need to be very uh, aware about this friendly bias because most of the time people tend to uh, uh, fall in this uh, bias the fourth bias that are very, that is very common uh, when we do qualitative research is the social desirability bias and here the tendency for people to answer question in a way that will be viewed favor favorably by others and as you can see here people are always uh, are looking to be recognized by others so here they will not express their self and the quality of the feedback will be very low they will just look at what is the favorable answer and they will answer it while in reality you will not get the truth behind their answer so it's very important to be aware about those four biases now let me take you to validity as a concept validity as a concept in qualitative research is very difficult to apply because simply by default qualitative research produces subjective results however the role of the researcher is to avoid the bias so we try to avoid the bias or at least neutralize it or to become very conscious about it and in this sense having the ability to show through your research that you are measuring what you intended to measure and that you have obtained accurate data is one of the ways to show uh, the rigor of your approach also the concept of reliability is very difficult to apply in qualitative research so here like i told you qualitative research um, is subjective however the role of the re researcher here is to avoid the bias and if possible try to at least show the ability to reproduce the work for sure reprodu reproduction or reproducibility of work in qualitative research is almost impossible so the extent that the study can be reprodu reproduced uh, is very hard but what we try to do here we place the responsibility with the researcher to make them more aware about the work so this is a very important aspect and here comes the importance of triangulation well the first person who talked about triangulation is Norman Denzen in an academic context and he confirmed he, he defined triangulation confirms like he stated that triangulation confirms and validates the quality results using quantitative uh, uh, studies or qualitative also by using multiple sources and methods inadequacies in one approach or process can be minimized and for sure more insight can be obtained by using multiple methods for triangulation and inconsistencies can be recognized and removed during the triangulation process for sure triangulation is increased uh, 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 triangulation increases and strengthens the credibility of the work and the validity of the data and leads to stronger research design so therefore it needs to be taken into account from the beginning during your development of your conceptual study framework during your development of your methodology that you only not focus on the data collection aspect or how you will process the data or how will you sample uh, your subjects but it's very also important to think about how you will validate your outcomes how you validate your findings and how you triangulate now you are ready to understand what are the types of triangulations actually there are four types of triangulation number one is triangulation based on data sources number two triangulation based on investigators triangulation based on theoretical basis and triangulation with different methodological approaches let me explain each of those in detail so what is data triangulation it's simply using multiple data sources so here we use three different sources at least if the source of information in my research is literature then I will try to diversify my literature if it's people then I will change my subjects my patients so in this sense when we do triangulation or data triangulation we try to diversify the sources the people the subjects the time the setting the observations that we are doing the different sources of information the articles or the scientific material if we have statistics if we can have field studies so by that the data that we are using we triangulate it and for sure we also can diversify the, the data sources by using primary sources uh, against secondary sources and in this sense it's very important to be very aware about the following 
if you cite and rely on the same single source for information, a red flag warning must hold us off. So here this is an example of not triangulating my data by simply relying mainly on one theory or relying on one source in building up my research while not diversifying my data sources. So this is the first option you can have, data triangulation. The second option of uh, uh, triangulation in qualitative research is to have multiple investigators. In this sense, you are involving multiple researchers collecting or analyzing the data, including interviewers, observers, facilitators, researchers or data analysis, uh, analysts in a study. And in this sense, the ability to confirm the findings across the different investigators uh, will improve the research without prior discussion or collaboration between them can significantly enhance the credibility of the findings. So this is also very common when we do interviewing, for example, to use the investigators or the multiple uh, investigators in, in the interpretation of the research or even in the data collection. Let's move now to the third uh, type of triangulation, which is the theoretical uh, triangulation. And here, if you are applying theories in your research and you are trying to apply them to your observations, here you can see the use of more than one theory or hypothesis when investigating a phenomenon. For example, a researcher may use two different psychological theories to explain the, sa the same phenomenon, such as the competitive and the cooperative behavior in dogs, for example. So this is an example that you will triangulate by using different theories to interpret your findings. And finally, the last types of uh, triangulation, which is the most famous, which is called the multiple method triangulation. And here we use different methods to have multiple perspectives on the study issue for cross verification. For example, we use observation and case study and interviews. We use focus group and interviews and observation. We use videos and pictures, uh, interviews and observation. So we triangulate different methods, at least three, to make sure that when we are triangulating those methods, the information is coming from different methods. So this is the fourth most famous uh, triangulation type. Now, if you ask me among those four types of triangulation that we use in research, which is the most important and which is the most commonly used, I would say number one, the methodological triangulation. So when you are conducting qualitative research, you don't only, you do not only rely, let's say, on an interview or only doing a focus group discussion. You can try to triangulate your methods using or combining focus group discussion with interviews, with observation, for example, or with literature review to make sure that the information that you are collecting and the interpretation are done through three different methods. And here, this is the most common one. The second most common triangulation technique is the data sources. So you focus here on triangulating your data collection. But for sure, the data sources triangulation is limited to the data collection. It will not be uh, used further during your processing of your data and in the interpretation of your result. So it's considered more kind of uh, limited. For sure, the investigator triangulation is very strongly used in interviews and um, when we do uh, observations when we do usability testing uh, but as I told you earlier the number one is the methodological triangulation if you have time I would advise to do methodological triangulation and data sources and for sure if you are applying a lot of theories in your work and you are trying to interpret a phenomena within certain behavioral uh, context then the theoretical triangulation will be essential so it depends on the context but my general advice is always to start with the methodological methodological triangulation well that's it for the types of triangulation let's move now to the following point of today's presentation which is the negative case sampling what is the negative case sampling it's a very important technique which is asking yourself what is the story this data is telling me and not only focusing on what I want to tell through the story. Because what happens, like I told you, qualitative research by default is subjective. We sometimes uh, project or uh, um, imply our own interpretation on the story. And we take a certain perspective that is closer to what we think, like remember the biases I was talking about. So here when we're talking about a negative case sampling, here we are trying to 
look at a different perspective to the story, there are other stories that can be told from this data. So by that, I start to look in a different way and I say, okay, the negative case sampling is simply telling myself, okay, this is the story and the perspective that I think uh, uh, is uh, an outcome of my analysis, but what about other stories that could be behind? So I have to make sure to check the negative cases and not what is not told. It's always the obvious is what is told, but I need always to fetch what is not told, like especially when I talked about the biases that are common between people. So make a subjectivity and reflexivity uh, audit during your research and make sure that when you are conducting your qualitative research method, you have a kind of uh, third party, uh, can be done by yourself even, you don't need to have a third party, but a third party alike approach so that you say, okay, this is what I think, but what could be another story? What could be another perspective? What could be another story that was not told? So this is called the negative case sampling and it's also a very uh, efficient and effective technique to improve uh, or increase the reliability and validity of your qualitative research methods. And the final technique that can be used in, in triangulation when you do qualitative research is the pattern recognition and the fair representation for our sampling. So here what we talk about is about validating your climbs. So describe any pattern of incidences and its frequency in your research when you are conducting your research and report any significant finding even if you have a N1, which is mean one sample only, your subject is, num is only one subject or you have only one case study. In fact, an N of one trial is a trial in which a single subject is the entire trial and a single case study, that's it, all you have. So in this sense, you have to report the outliers and embrace them to find the other story and you have to describe your biases as much as you can, even the internal biases. If you are a female, you have to describe that you are having a certain bias as a female. If you are a male, you have to describe your bias as a male. If you are conducting a study and you are a white uh, person, uh, uh, if you are a colored person, uh, if you are coming from a certain background, if you are coming from a certain social economical uh, context, all these biases need to be described and we need to be very aware, aware about them. And when you are conducting your qualitative research, especially when you are using a little number of sample, one case study only or one only subject or you did only one trial, you did one testing for example, in this sense you need to define very, very well what are the patterns that you find and how fair are you, uh, this sample is representing uh, a certain population and how you might be also influencing result by internal bias. Well, by that I end up today's presentation and I will take you through some takeaway messages before we close today's presentation. So, in this presentation I talked about what is triangulation. Well, it is a strategy to enhance the quality of the research to make it reliable, dependable and valid. Triangulation is an idea of using different sources to verify the authenticity of the information uh, of the information and it is important since single perspective is never reliable and is too biased so it's very important to look at it there is four types of triangulations that we talked about today the data triangulation the investigators triangulation the theoretical triangulation and the method uh, triangulation and finally triangulation helps you to unveil the complexities of phenomena understudy and provide insights on the subject matter. By that, I hope you benefit of today's presentation about triangulation and you will apply it in your qualitative research. Today's presentation was the ending presentation of a series on qualitative research methods. I hope you enjoyed this series and you hope you could apply it and never forget to apply always triangulation when you are conducting qualitative research. Thank you very much. Today's presentation about triangulation, I hope you enjoyed this series and don't hesitate to go back to the videos and watch them again. Thank you very much.